Welcome to Shit Island, named the number one comedy podcast in the world by the Shit Island Institute of Podcasts. Today we are joined by David Rovix, who is a folk musician and an activist uh, known for such songs as I'm a Better Anarchist Than You, They All Sang the International, Rojava, and many more. Yeah, David is a um, left-wing musician who's been known for uh, criticizing American politics for decades now and has written some very beautiful and melodic left-wing anthems that people use at uh, protests. And uh, he's going to be on tour soon. So look him up uh, and uh, remember to follow and listen to his podcast, which is uh, which should be linked in the description of this video. You can go to davidrovix.com and you'll find... Uh, everything you need there, tour information, and his weekly podcast, This Week with David Rovix, which we highly recommend. So let's uh, let's get to the talk with uh, David. My age has never been confirmed, so... Nor denied. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> That's better. We just know that Peter may have gone through a midlife crisis at one point. I think I had several already. <laughs> yeah, let me just say, Billy Joel's recount of uh, Vietnam is highly inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> i've never heard his recount of vietnam but uh, i'm sure i don't want to it's great he he wrote a song about vietnam called uh good night saigon which is admittedly great but he never went to vietnam and he he didn't talk to <laughs> oh any kids so it was all like uh, yeah i think he just saw some war movies maybe he saw like full metal jacket and he was like yeah i get this i get this war thing uh, i'm gonna do that just going to write my memoirs off being the Iraq war. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to Iraq, but, yeah. you know. You can watch uh, American Sniper. And <laughs> all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> just just get the most accurate and objective account on what happened. Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Tucker Carlson. Bastion of academic integrity. No, journalistic integrity. Fair and balanced. It's their motto. Indeed. I mean, it's their motto, so it must be true. Yeah. Yeah. What's our motto? What's the what's the shit island motto? Unfair and biased. <laughs> Fair and biased. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We, we came up with a great. Jules came up with a great one today in the chat. What was it? Oh, that the dictatorship of the Untermenschen. That's it. Yeah. The dictatorship. <laughs> oh, I of love the it. Of the Unt Oh, that's fantastic. Because <laughs> I've been using mine for the, my podcast. This one make popular education popular again. But nobody knows what popular education is. So <laughs> that's much better. Nobody knows what Untermenschen is either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, the topic for today, uh, seeing as how you're mainly a musician, but also an activist, is uh, music. And more specifically, we want to talk about the question, can music change the world? Hmm. That's a good subject. That's definitely one of my yeah. favorites. Uh, I guess my question mainly directed at, at you, David, but uh, we can all answer the questions here. What's the purpose of music within politics well i mean the thing is music has always been just another form of communication when it comes to songs and stuff i mean songs words it's just words mm -hmm. sung and when you sing words they go to the art they go to the centers of the brain that affect your emotions and we can talk about this now in terms of science because this science has been done and apparently you know it's 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 confirmed what musicians have already known forever which is that <clears throat> when you sing uh, words and they rhyme uh, that there's something about that that affects the mind in a magical way and allows you to access the depths of your emotional center and you can uh, identify with things in a visceral way that is almost impossible without actually experiencing it otherwise you know th through forms like music and film and you know other forms of expression that are you know have this ability to to communicate so you know viscerally in terms of the, the emotional response mm. of the listener so i think basically that's the role that music plays in uh, in terms of politics, but it, it plays that role whether you're talking about uh, you know the, the the left or the right or anything else. I mean, you know, all humans or all organized groups of humans have used music for different purposes. Yeah. 
Uh, That's yeah. such a good way of explaining it, I think. And also, if you look at it from the way of or the view of science and philosophy, uh, then you, you'd also hear this explanation that we see ourselves way more as logical and rational beings than we really are. We're very controlled by our feelings and our emotions and what we connect to and narratives and fairy tales and stories. And we need them to make sense of the world. So I think that's also, would, would you agree, David, that it's also like the, uh, music acts as, as these narrative stories that appeal to our emotions and kind of make sense of the world, either politically or like emotionally? Yeah, absolutely. And, and especially um, for making sense of things that we are unfamiliar with, like or previously unfamiliar with, especially for introducing people to uh, things that seem very unfamiliar or very foreign you know, uh, you can, through music, uh, familiarize the unfamiliar and humanize the dehumanized. I think songs can do that <clears throat> really well. And, and then when people are ready to look into something further because they have had their uh, sort of wall of ice broken by music, then they can look into other forms of communication that provide a lot more information and context like books and you know world travel or whatever you know that so songs are obviously very short form communication they're only good for very brief introductions to subjects it makes me think of bohemian rhapsody which is you know a six minute song that the uh, the record label rejected because uh, it was too long it was an eternity they said and and it also makes me think of the ballad of joe hill which i can't recall exactly how long it is but it is you know quite a tale Phil Phil Oaks's ba Ballad of Joe. Yeah, it's just insanely long. I mean, I don't know what he was thinking. Like, I mean, but there's this whole thing of the the traditional English and Irish ballads, and Icelandic uh, ballads that uh, go on forever. So I guess there were some people experimenting with really really long form writing. But I think basically, since the music industry has been dominant for the past century or so, uh, songs have gotten uh, generally shorter in terms of anything that ever gets played on the radio. Oh, yeah. And th there were some brief exceptions to that. In in the late 60s and early 70s but generally it's it's been uh you know short everything gets shorter is it more difficult to produce this kind of narrative and this kind of story uh, with only you know two or three minutes it's a really strict uh form to work with which provides it's it's like there's all these uh, it's really challenging but if you if you manage to work within the form and you you, you can effectively rise to the challenge then it's like uh yeah, i think a really powerful hmm. thing to do with two or three minutes <clears throat> but it's um there's a lot of uh, pitfalls, a lot of things to avoid. You you can't uh, try to tell too many stories. Yeah. Usually, just one is 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 plenty. You know, if you. Yeah, I uh, oh god, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard a um, a song called "Repeat Stuff" by Bo Burnham. No, it's a, a satirical. Uh, well, it, it, it's 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 like a satirical song about the the music industry and about pop stars specifically and uh, there's a line in there about how the american audience or i suppose just you know musical the, the average consumer of music in general wants to know the lyrics of the song after just listening to it once and they want to know you know the the chorus of the song and they want to know it by heart after listening to it one time they want to just know the words already and uh, they don't want to sit through songs with actual meaning and you know songs that they have to think about yeah i think that uh, that it is our reality now or has been for a long time because of the music industry and it's gotten a lot worse and it, i mean i guess it depends a lot on the country but especially in the united states since 1980 it's been uh the most in, in, in pronounced and it's just gotten worse where you know the average radio station commercial station which is most of what people are exposed to is playing the same 200 songs or less every day in rotation yeah. so if it's not something that you're really familiar with then people often just can't deal with it you know it's uh, they don't know what to do it, it needs to be something that's been hammered in to them you know sort of involuntarily you know hundreds of times first yeah. you know, before they recognize it i have a question um that i've been wondering about and i it's it's such a privilege to be able to, to ask a, an actual musician but um one of the things that 
really that people really hit home when Trump first became president was this idea that oh, okay great now we're gonna get all this fantastic protest music and this outrage music and we're gonna get punk rock again and uh, comedy is gonna get better and culture is gonna get better and everything's just gonna there's gonna be this uh, this thing that we can push against artistically but if you listen to the radio it, it doesn't seem like that's reflected at all there hasn't really unless you like if you unless you count this as America there really hasn't been any kind of political uh, pushback artistically that's been successful in the mainstream that I've noticed anyway do you do you think that's deliberate in some way or do you think people just don't want to think about Trump when they're listening to music or is that something that you have like uh, an idea about it's kind of it's kind of a complicated uh, subject because it, there's so many different aspects to it in terms of like what actually makes it into people's ears in terms of like what's played on the radio, what gets through people's Facebook feeds and or wherever else people are getting information. But generally, I I would say from my experience, uh, it's it's social movements when there's a when there's a really active, widespread social movement, it tends to produce lots of music, and I then tend to hear about it. It seems to me, but I don't know if I'm necessarily plugged into all the social movements that may or may not be happening. But as far as I can tell, uh, there is no real coherent <clears throat> sort of movement against Trump happening. Hmm. And uh, it's because I think basically social movements need always historically everywhere in the world historically with very, very few exceptions, like very specific few exceptions. I think social movements always require a combination of conditions and optimism in order to exist. So you have to have... Uh, you know, if if you're going to have a, a movement against, uh, you know, f a fascism or war or whatever, then you need fascism or war or whatever you're having a movement against. But you also need a widespread optimism, a widespread sense that you might uh, actually f ha succeed if you engage it w using a certain tactic and if everybody's in it together, if there's solidarity, you know, then th that's when the movement happens. But as soon as people think, oh, we're losing, this isn't going anywhere movements fall apart and you end up with uh, the small little hardcore usual suspects who are there regardless of what's going on ever you know there's always a, a few but you don't you don't there's times when movements happen when there's this kind of optimism and it, like during bush's second term there was very little happening here because people were so depressed i think i mean i can only guess but i think people were generally depressed that this guy had gotten elected for, to a second term and and so you know people were just like oh well what's the point yeah. you know that's that's it's always this combination. Do you think that... And I, we, we don't have that any optimism. There is no optimism here. Yeah. Wow. You, like on, on the left in general, um, there's a lot of defeatism. Um, how long has that been? Where did the, the optimism of, you know, uh, 2008 Obama's presidential campaign, where did that go? <sighs> well, that was always a false optimism to begin with. So it was... Uh, it there, a lot of people got sucked into this idea uh, that something different was happening. I mean, this is always the role of the Democratic Party is to sort of uh, uh, suck up any real uh, sort of uh, optimistic uh, energy toward for for social change and and try to direct it to, to their corporate imperialist little machine and and destroy it. And you know what happened during Obama's presidency was the country got poorer and more divided and more stratified. You know, we got health care, but at the same time, generally the cost of living and the cost of housing rose so much that for most of us that you know you, you don't notice that you got free health care when the rent is doubled, you know. Uh, so it's it's um it's been a disaster. Ne you know, neo neoliberalism has been a disaster here, and it's continued under both parties, regardless of what you know they say about uh, who they pretend to represent. They <coughs> represent the corporate elite, and you know this is uh, this is when you have you have a government that is supposedly progressive. And 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 sort of embraces this progressive mantle somehow, and people believe it's somehow progressive, and then they associate left or le the left with with this kind of like nonsense kind of supposed progressivism, which is just 
another form of corporate imperial rule, you know, with with a with a friendly face, you know, it's um, it, it doesn't. Uh, then then of course the the left becomes something that people don't have any confidence in because look if that's what the left is, you know. I mean, during the course of the global justice movement, those of us involved were always trying to say, this is a global justice movement. We're for global justice. This is not an anti-globalization movement. We're not saying, you know, we're not saying foreigners get out. You know, that's not what this is about, you know. But they always were trying to turn it into the media, you know, always trying to turn the movement into this, uh, oh, they're against uh, globalization, it, you know, confusing the whole issue. And, and now eventually you get to where we're at now, where where you think of uh, protectionism, and you think of uh, national protecting national economies and s- sovereignty, and uh, then you think of fascists, you know, and you think of uh, the left, and you, and you think of globalism, and and you know, uh, open borders and and corporate profits rising and gentrification, which somehow all go together. It doesn't make any sense, but but this is how people are now imagining these totally meaningless concepts of left and right at this mm-hmm. point. I think as uh, I mean, it's just a as mess. Scandinavians, uh, Peter and I are pretty familiar with uh, you know corporate interest, corporate and, and imperial interests with uh, a friend of the face. Having had social democratic governments for you know the last hundred years or so. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, the the progressive liberal and neoliberal movement aren't really interested at all in some kind of solidarity and i think you're absolutely right in saying that they kind of swooped in and and created this uh this what do you call it like almost like definitely shallow but uh, but this media optimism around obama and i think it was um just just for me remembering back it was a, a pretty hard blow for leftists in 2008 when they realized that um obama was just another neoliberal um after everything that he'd he talked about and everything that he said he was going to do when he was elected, um, despite knowing that he wasn't going to be able to. So, yeah, I think I think you're yeah. absolutely right in your analysis. I mean, this is one of those. I mean, I don't want to switch gears into an advertisement here, but I'm an American, so this is one of those things that made me want to start doing a podcast. I don't know about you, but it's <laughs> like you know, people don't. People don't have so many people have no clue what was going on as recently as say like the 1990s. I mean, you know, anybody who remembers all the stuff around Bill Clinton, who I think who was it, Maya, somebody, Maya Angelou called him our first black president. I mean, yeah. you know, the uh, kind yes. of like nonsense that was going around around this 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 racist thug Bill yes. Clinton. You know, this yep. is uh, this was going on all over again around Obama, mm. and it's I just. You know, recently I heard some Australian journalist who who was making really, really basic mistakes uh, with confusing World War One with World War Two, <laughs> and this is the kind of thing that keeps on happening. Where you know, really supposedly, you know, you know, informative sources or people that maybe have some education who just don't, you know, we're just repeating the same things. We just go through this every four years, and it's it's so, it's so repetitive and so tiring. Uh, of course, nobody listens to my podcast, so it doesn't matter what <laughs> I'm saying about it. But you know, I just thought there's we need to we break this this cycle. It's just outrageous. just you wait. You're gonna get that shit island bump, that uh, patented <laughs> shit island bump. Oh yeah, that's oh yeah. Gonna, <laughs> so everyone that listens to shit island, go, go listen to David's podcast. Yeah, it's <laughs> good. It's good. <laughs> Are you on iTunes? We can't get on iTunes. <laughs> oh yeah. Why not? Because of our, uh, our, Why not? our the name of our podcast. Um, yeah. Oh, seriously. Yeah. Yes. Oh, geez. There, uh, we should know there are other podcasts with the name shit in it, but ours is too. Uh, no. Yeah. I, ours is too much emphasis on the shit. I guess I, I don't know. Yeah, there is a <laughs> podcast on iTunes yeah. called well, Shitstorm, and that's somehow allowed. But that's fine. Isn't. That's fine. Yeah. C- can you just do like S uh, star star T? I mean, that would be really hard for people yeah, to find. Yeah, uh, that was one of the issues, and uh, and also iTunes actually has a rule against censoring curse words uh, so using a curse word and censoring yeah. a curse word are just as bad to them so oh, yeah no we decided to uh, to not go with Apple in the end mm. um, we're, we're bigger than Apple anyway yeah we're sticking to our principles here <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but, you're, <laughs> but you're getting listeners without iTunes, so that's good if people are managing to find yeah. it. But yeah, um, I was uh, listening to one of your songs on Spotify the other day, uh, the one about Rojava, and mm. uh, there's a line in there um, that goes, "What makes a person go from Occupy Wall Street to marching through the desert with blisters on their feet?" Mm. I don't think the song ever really answered the question. What does make, you know, a milk toast liberal protesting on Wall Street end up volunteering for the YPG? You know, are those the same oh. people who were at Wall Street uh, who years down the line became radicalized? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, I'd say the people involved with Occupy Wall Street would, you would certainly not describe most of them as milk toast liberals. It was largely a movement of uh, poor people uh, in in the United States. I don't know about um, if it was, it, it, I don't think it was like that in Europe necessarily, although it had some of that characteristic in London, but it was much more a symbolic protest than a lot of other places, but it was a, it was a good uh, movement that had a lot of impact on a lot of people for a couple of months there. A lot of the impact came from wanton police brutality, which is, of course, usually the case with social movements that they learn about <clears throat> how reality is, uh, you know, from the billy clubs and tear gas and rubber bullets. Mm -hmm. But um, they, the, the, a lot of people came through that little movement uh, more radicalized than when they entered it, and and that was um, I'm, I would I don't know if that's necessarily the case of uh, you know some of the folks who are veterans of that movement who joined the struggle in Rojava and died fighting there, but uh, you know certainly they came out of that movement you know and other people in, in, in other people on the left uh, in rojava from around the world came from other uh, sort of more or less similar movements whatever movements have been happening were the ones that people came out of whether it was the you know the uh uh you know the, the the that movement in Spain, the, the Indignados, or or the uh, or Occupy Wall Street, or the Global Justice Movement before that, or or the squatting uh, movements in various countries. You know, mm. it, it, different movements. Whatever's happening at the time is what's going to tend to radicalize people who are involved, and that'll happen in various forms. But do you think that people were? radicalized after the feeling that Occupy didn't really achieve what people hoped it would? I don't know. I think, um, I, I don't know what people necessarily uh, hoped it, it might achieve, but I, I, th I think that uh, the idea was very much along the lines of, uh, you know, it's a, it was a it was a sort of a, an anonymous social movement in much the way the Gilets Jaunes is or, or any number of other movements. So it's so there's no spokespeople and, and I'm just, uh, you know, yeah, theorizing, you know, it, it was. But but I think that uh, it was um, the idea of holding space like uh, with the and I, th I don't think this can be overemphasized in terms of the importance of any movement that engages in ho <clears throat> holding public space like the Gilets Jaunes do today and like Occupy Wall Street or the uh, uprisings in the Arab world, uh, the, uh, the, what they call the Arab Spring or or the squatting movement in many different European countries or the MST in Brazil. This whole idea of holding, taking and holding public space is, um, is, is very powerful and it allows for a lot of things to happen that can't happen unless there's a, a actual physical space that people are holding on to but it's it's a powerful it's powerful symbolically and in terms of uh, organizing um, and that was I think what it was about more than anything else like saying look we're, we're, we're here in the midst of all this wealth I mean all the different um, Occupy encampments were in the middle of the most uh, outrageous displays of <clears throat> steel and glass yeah. um, opulence. Mm. Yeah, I, th I, I think you're absolutely right. And um, one of the, the main successes of Occupy Wall Street, I think, was just popularizing this idea that the 99% were against the 1%. This speaking line that uh, Bernie Sanders then took over a few years later uh, and, and uh, used to his own message. 
um, that came out of Occupy, and I think that's just the if it if that's the only thing that came out of it, I think that's a really powerful uh, well, a thing yeah. to have uh, to have popularized in in the political discourse. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, just just that the use of these terms, ninety nine percent and one percent. Yeah, this that, which I've been doing my whole life, <laughs> and it's been it was so nice that like, it became popular. Now you get I, for a while you can't do it now, but for at least a couple of years I walked around with a hat that just said ninety nine percent on it. You know, and, and everybody knew what it was about, and that was that was cool to to see the how widespread this concept was. Then after a couple of years, then people are like, "What's this? A sale going on somewhere?" <laughs> Yeah, oh, interesting. Uh, I mean, as, as someone who uh, is used to reading very dry Marxist, uh, you know, literature and, and academic literature, um, the, the whole the ninety nine percent and the one percent uh, terminology really is the modern version of the old bourgeoisie and proletariat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Workers of the world, class mm-hmm. yeah. struggle. It is cl- the yeah. class struggle. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a very effect. It, it's a lot more effective than saying working class, because a lot of people don't want to count themselves as working class, even if they are. Mm. Yeah, or they just don't know what that means. I mean, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, who in his first run in for president, was frequently using the term working class is now uh, in his new run uh, referring to his family as middle class, even though he says uh, his father was like, uh, what did did his father do? He he was like, worked in, it was some obviously really clearly working class job, like high school education. I can't remember what his dad did, but it was like. I think he was like a mechanic or something. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, but they were. He grew up quite, quite poor, but quite solidly working class Brooklyn, I think. And uh, this is, uh, but they all called themselves middle class. I mean, my father grew up in Brooklyn too. Nobody called themselves working class in his in his environment. They all referred to each other as middle yeah. class. Um, That's just what you do in the U.S. Nobody's yeah. working class. Everybody's either middle, lower, or upper middle. And and you know, yet yeah, nobody's rich, nobody's poor, nobody's working yeah. class. They would no, nobody would own up to that. There's an old saying that um, in America, no one is uh, poor. Everyone is a temporarily disenfranchised millionaire, which yes. I think still applies for the most part. That, you know, even if you are really down in the dumps, except maybe if you are really like in poverty, you want to see yourself as middle class. You want to see yourself as average or above average, even if you are quite clearly not. Well, I I think basically because they're ba- basically I think there are some really big and significant differences in terms of long standing and maybe short term U.S. history compared with most other countries in the West, and w- the one of the things that's kept the U.S. from having any kind of a real uh, solid, broad, widespread. Uh, broad-based class uh, uh, analysis of their own circumstances, which is like the the kind of class analysis that you find much more commonly in many other countries. I think we we have not been able to gain that. And I think less largely because of divide and rule around race. Mm. And so basically any working class <coughs> white person has to be middle class because if they admit that they're not middle class, that means that they might not be better than black people. And any black person has to be middle class because if they admit that they're working class, then they're admitting that they're inferior to white people. So everybody has to be middle class. Yeah. Do you think that, I mean, I guess it's it's, it's pretty obvious, but do you think that it's intentional by, you know, the rich and the powerful to make it so muddled and confused about what class am I, who do I belong to, what group, you know, where where do my allegiances lie? Definitely. Yeah, they've always just used race in a way to divide people around class. Mm. You know, it's the same, same. It's so, it's so remarkably similar to the history of the divide in the north of Ireland as well. In terms of the way, you know, the, the, I heard a speaker there in Belfast, uh, Derry, uh, who was saying recently that the sixth w- worst ha- housing in uh, Western Europe is uh, in is among the. Uh, Catholic community in 
uh, in Northern Ireland, and the fifth worst housing in Western Europe is among the Protestants of Northern Ireland. <laughs> you know, and this hmm. uh, you know, says everything. That's a great thing. Uh, I have a, uh, a, 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 a question in a different vein again. Um, one of the main things that Zizek is talking about at the moment, the Slovenian philosopher, is this conception of, um, or this idea that, and, and perpetration that the left wing today, especially to young people, comes across like a moralizing conservative force in the world that's kind of more so interested in preserving and uh, shutting people up than it is in coming up with with new ideas and uh, what the alt right and the rising populist right has been good at is sort of presenting itself as this punk rock your parents don't like us movement that can kind of you know coast on irony and humor so i was just wondering is that is that mm -hmm. something that you've come across is there anything that like do you think that how do you think we do you think music can combat that do we combat that with art do we is it just the mood of the moment do you think or uh, have you given that any thought yeah i mean it's it's um it's such a conundrum that we're in because uh, you know, the what people think of as left today is no longer uh, about uh, uh, class uh, struggle or the, or the things that are familiar in terms of historically what it means to be left and it's uh, and and they don't so the, so what it means to be left in uh, in the, so many people's minds these days at least in in the western world it no longer has to do with uh the things that interest uh, most people because most people in most places are struggling uh, particularly that's true in you know these days in the united states and in a lot of other countries people are struggling and and they that's what they're interested in i think much more is is in some kind of a a system where they can uh, prosper um, and uh, you know they're looking for those kinds of answers and and what they're mostly getting is uh, right wingers uh, fomenting uh, hatred and left wingers uh, attacking right wingers who are fomenting hatred and you know they're and and who seem to be but the left wingers they're not really left wingers they're 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 really more i'd say you know neoliberal imperialists so you know democrats posing as progressive who have taken the mantle of the left you know it, 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 because that's that's what because the media gave it to them right you know i mean the real left is uh, i mean what hap what the real left has never been in power in the united states mm -hmm. Uh, you know the real left doesn't have any representation in electoral politics in the United States and and never has you know at, le at least in some European countries there are authentic left wingers who have a certain small percentage of you know, who hold public office you know who, who are not neoliberal social democrats but are actually authentic I mean I'd say like Eni's list in Denmark <laughs> for example you know, I, I, I would count as among the actual left you know I know lots of people within Eni's list who are actual you know left wingers from when they were small and very you know concretely seriously you know left analysis who are in in the party but this is um this is not the case with with most social democratic parties in europe and it's certainly never been the case uh with either of the main parties in the united states and the media any media whether it's uh, pro mainstream media or any other media who falls into these kinds of terms of you talking about left and right as if left actually has any representation in U.S. Uh, politics. Mm, yeah. I mean, it just ends up perpetuating the problem because you know we don't. Yeah. Amen. It's, uh, yeah. That is the answer. The answer is, I think you're right. Is is getting these centrist neoliberals out of the way of the left and no longer accepting that that they represent the actual left because they've kind of messed everything up in the perception of the population about what the left wing represents uh politically and morally yeah. and ethically i think yeah and or if that's right and then and then maybe we just have to abandon the use of terms like the left if that's who the left is if they you know i mean if the republicans have the color red i mean <laughs> okay well i guess i guess i can't say i'm a red anymore people don't know what i mean in in the united states yeah. uh, you know that, that's but if uh 
yeah, I mean, sometimes we got to roll with it and you know figure out what kinds of terms uh, actually mean something. But if we can, if if people understand that we mean we re- we we are standing with the ninety nine percent, and that makes sense, and people can get that, then let's stick with that. We re- we represent the ninety nine yeah. percent. But uh, you know, if they don't understand what left means, I mean, I've never. It, most of us have always been uncomfortable with this left right thing anyway, because it just sounds so academic. I mean, it has something to do with who is standing to the left or right of Hegel or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's it's we need better terms than that anyway. Yeah. You know, I I have no attachment to the term left. Mm. No, that's 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 a very fair analysis. I think um, if if people don't know your music, do you have a, a a song or two that you could recommend as a good entry point to your discography i'm a better anarchist than you you should start with that <laughs> uh, i love that one <laughs> <laughs> it is a good one it's also the most popular your most popular song on the spotify list yeah so you don't have to look too hard <laughs> and what's it about just uh out of curiosity if you oh sure it's just about uh a lot of my friends who uh you know think you know, it's, it's just about people in their generally not exclusively but usually people in their early 20s who think they know everything yeah. that's a great topic uh you know who, oh. <laughs> <laughs> considering the uh, current hosts of this program <laughs> <laughs> not naming any names but <laughs> <laughs> no, that is, yeah. You really do think you've got it all figured out in your early 20s, don't you? It kind of comes with the territory. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's just how it is. And, you know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. But it, but it is something to be to make fun of. You know, it's that's important. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> David, uh, it's about time that we run things off. But thank you so much for, for being with us and uh, taking the time out of your day. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to plug? Oh yeah, sure. If anybody out there in uh, in Scandinavia or elsewhere in Europe, uh, um, April sixth, opening day at Cafe Hellebeck, I'll be there running a little cafe on Uresund, uh, separating uh, Den- on the on the sea between Denmark and Sweden near Helsingør. And I'll be the guest barista for the summer, and everybody should come visit and get an espresso. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm. That's a beautiful place, too. I highly recommend uh, having a, a lovely day there with some uh, some coffee with some uh, yeah. upper-middle-class people by the by the ocean. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It's beautiful. And uh, living there would be expensive, but it's it's relatively inexpensive to oh, visit, yeah. <laughs> especially by bicycle. I think it's it's by that castle that they uh, or that uh, by, yeah. by the, the Hamlet castle, the one that Shakespeare references in Hamlet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This episode of Shit Island is brought to you by the radio. The radio. Please come back. Social media isn't fun. Okay, so uh, we have some emails from our dear listeners that we that we will get to. Uh, we'll we'll go with this first email here from Ryan Hawker, mm-hmm. who asks, "What would education in a post-capitalist society look like?" I live in Arizona, and I'm currently in my final year of high school. While pretty much all of my teachers have been amazing, and I'm really thankful. I live in a country that provides me 12 years of public education. As I look back on everything that I've been through, it seems pretty obvious to me that one of the school system's function is to conditional all of us for wage labor. Yeah. While I find most of what I learn about to be very interesting, a lot of the actual work I do every day is very repetitive, boring, and pointless. Have Marx or any other cool people written about what a post-capitalist education system might look like? Cheers, Ryan H. Well... Well, Ryan, you sent you sent that email in to the right podcast. Indeed, yeah. As you know, we here at Shit Island really care about you know academic performance and all that. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, I am studying to become a social studies and history teacher. Peter is also minoring mm-hmm. in teaching, and Jules. And I'm staying the fuck away from children. <laughs> they are creepy as fuck. You are going to university <laughs> though. Yes, to keep away from the children. You find very few children at the university, I found. It's very nice, actually. It's one of the main stunning points, I think. Basically, there are a lot of different you know, theories about how teaching should work. Uh, I think America, I want to say they, they cling on to the, the classical conditioning behaviorist uh, ideology of teaching. But I could be wrong about that, but it feels like that's... Can you explain what that means? Uh, classical conditioning, as, as you know, first um, written about by Ivan Pavlov, and applied to teaching, basically means that students are 
rewarded for good behavior, such as getting high test scores or just being quiet in class. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they are punished for bad behavior. And, you know, 100 years ago, this would be literally by, you know, physically punishing them with a large stick. In more civilized times, we use psychological horror instead, such as isolation and exclusion, which leads long-lasting scars on the brain instead of on the skin. The uh, the most recent, or at least the most recent, mainstream theory within teaching and pedagogy is uh, what I, I learned that it's called the socio-cultural perspective on teaching. But it goes by other names as well, so I don't know what it's named as on Wikipedia, but I think you can just look up socio-cultural perspective pedagogy and you should find information about it. Yeah, it's also called the uh, social constructivist. Ah. Um, Now that's a term I've heard a few times. It emphasizes a more passive role of the teacher, less active but still very much supportive, and it emphasizes the... uh, autonomy and independence of the students but also uh, for the the teacher to be there to provide tools the most important of which is language Uh, and and this is a process called scaffolding where if you are familiar with gardening for example you might think of a student as a delicate little flower which needs to grow to be very tall the teacher is there to provide scaffolding you know uh, you have sometimes you put sticks in the ground for the plants to climb up. That's the role of the teacher, basically. You're there to make sure that the student keeps growing as much as it can, but you're not there to dictate exactly how it's going to do that. You just sort of give it the general direction of, you know, upwards, and you provide tools and uh, it's scaffolding to... Help yeah, the students on its way, and every student is different. Obviously, very heavy emphasis on individualism and uh, not using cookie cutter methods. Always taking the individual into account. Um, you can read more about the scaffolding um, um, methodology and approach uh, if you Google Bruner or Vygotsky, and then scaffolding. It's about yeah, building a temporary structure around the thing that you're teaching them. So you're acting as a guide to help them learn something new and then slowly taking away the scaffolding so they can stand on their own, like being a guide yeah. as a teacher. Yeah, Yeah, the way I heard it explained during one of my classes on social constructivism, was it, is rather than just uh, having knowledge which can just be absorbed somehow, you're there to facilitate the creation of knowledge. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, um, And just really quickly to go back to his question about what it would look like under socialism, I highly recommend Mark Fisher's book, Capitalist Realism. He was a professor at a university, and he talked about how education today under capitalism in this late capitalist society where we're all plugged in all the time to our phones and to entertainment, we kind of, we, we have a hard time focusing um, generally on, on learning. And he talks about how it's, it's kind of, imp- like it's an imposition put onto us by neoliberalism and this individualism that comes with social constructivism as well, where we're always uh, trying to keep ourselves entertained and plugged in. And we kind of go into a tiny panic if we can't find our phone or if we can't if we can't um, uh, confirm that we we still have a, a leg in the ent- entertainment um, matrix, but uh, yeah, I mean, he talks about he talks about how it, it used to be different and how um, it's it's getting worse progressively. And like, if you look back in history before capitalism, even if back to the Socratic days, people would go to universities and they would study for decades at a time if they wanted to. And they would just more be there as a kind of formation of their knowledge and uh, to get a foundation or like a knowledge base that they could then spread to people uh, around where they came from, or just in general, have a uh, a purpose with the knowledge that they learned that wasn't just a single profession that like we see today where people usually yeah. go uh, to university or to professional schools for a specific type of line of work um, that mm-hmm. uh, that they then go and apply afterwards, which 
definitely plays into to this uh, wage labor thing that uh, that the email mentioned. Yeah, you're basically going to university to get like a certificate for a job in many respects. Yeah, so I think I think the answer that I would I would say after the end of neoliberalism or capitalism, if we want to be that uh, grand in our statements, I would say that it's it's going to be more focused on formation and it's going to be more focused on you learning what you want to learn at your pace. And it's going to be more mm. about you figuring out the utility of what you're learning and also just what you want to apply it to in a way that's yep. less about you becoming competent at one very specific thing and more about you learning a bunch of useful things and applying and like uh, get, getting as much out of your brain and your uh, abilities as possible that you can then contribute back to other people. Something that I'm very passionate about is uh, just giving students more possibilities to in investigate things that they're curious about. And I just, I would love for there to be more subjects available for high school students and even earlier for them to study things such as psychology and philosophy uh, and just interesting things. I mean, those are the things that I find interesting, but, you know, just stuff that different people find interesting just so that they can become passionate about learning anything because if all you're teaching them is english and maths and uh, literature and and then none of that is interesting to them then they will uh, uh, equate learning with boring and tedious work with nothing exciting ever happening and you have to sit in a classroom for eight hours and do what the teacher tells you to do that's not what learning is learning is great learning is it's life to be poetic about it i mean life is learning from all kinds of different things and and i i just want more people to be passionate about learning things and uh, i wish that i could have taken philosophy for longer and earlier than i was able to in the swedish education system fuck yeah make people passionate about learning that's that's a wonderful goal to have because learning is important and uh, we're not really being like encouraged to learn anymore i think i think we're more being encouraged to be paced into a very specific line that we then fit snugly into in, in these boxed ways of looking at education i think we need to go back to, to to general formation and general curiosity and knowledge so yeah i think that's a great aim for you as a teacher um Obviously, as a teacher, I won't have any control over that kind of stuff. No, but let's <laughs> let's imagine you will. <laughs> let's pretend. Uh, I'll, I might be a principal someday. I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. become the education minister if I join the Social Democratic Party. <laughs> yeah, just become a radical centrist. Solve everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, this episode is getting a bit long. Yeah. And there are three other emails and also the Humanities Good Corners. I think we're going to cut it here. Uh, and we'll do every we'll do the other emails and stuff next week. Sounds good. Yes, we will get to the emails just next week. Yeah, good. All right. So thank you all for listening to this episode of Shit Island with David Rovix. Do go check his stuff out once again. DavidRovix.com. He's also on Spotify and he's on iTunes. He's on all the stuff. Just search him up. Yeah, give him that Shit Island bump and uh, give me the Shit Island bump too. I'd like to experience it. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, come check out the discord that's most of a bump I can get out of this I guess yeah we have had yeah. a lot of new people join the discord server recently yeah yeah hell. like 20 people yesterday joined the discord server I think yeah, like all at the, once how, how did that happen what would... yeah no I don't know they all said that they came from like different places and different videos so it wasn't like a one single source I think it might have just been like the youtube algorithm giving me some of that you know, sweet, sweet, something. Uh, yes. <laughs> Getting me some extra views. Hell yeah. I don't know. Yeah, listeners, help Shit Island get on the YouTube algorithm wave somehow. <laughs> I don't know how you could do that, but if you could do that, please. Yeah, uh, I actually don't think we can because we have shit in the, in the title. Oh, uh, yeah, but I don't know. Anyway, if you... If you have questions for us, you have many ways of reaching us. You can leave comments under the video. Yeah, just leave a comment and I'll get to you. <laughs> yeah, ju if, you, if you want yeah. Jules, leave a comment. <laughs> it's probably even more effective yep. than, than joining the Discord yeah. server at this point. <laughs> um, uh, if you, yeah, you want to get in touch yeah. with me, probably Twitter. 
Yeah, me too. Uh, send in your, your questions. Send in your questions to shitislandshow at gmail.com and we'll answer it. Yes, but thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to Shit Island. Share it with all your friends and the people you don't like and the uh, people yeah. that uh, raised you and the people that hate you. Yeah, get your grandparents to uh, listen to yeah. it. Yeah, maybe don't. Well, uh, go for it. Maybe grandma's hip. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure grandma will love Shit Island. Yeah, and hey, Azure's dad, thank you for listening. We appreciate it. Yeah, sir. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week on Shit Island. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.